public, and I would remind uh, members that the committee meeting will, re will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings as well as online. We've got four members uh, attending the meeting in person today, myself, Emma Shear in the chair, Mike Nesbitt, the vice chair, Kelly Armstrong, who's attending today in her capacity as Paula Bradshaw's deputy, and Michelle McElveen. Joan O'Dowd is here over Starleaf um, as Carolyn Cullen's deputy, and Mark H. Durkin is with us via Starleaf as well. And we've been advised that Christopher Stalford will be attending, but he'll be late. So we'll go to agenda item one. We've got no apologies, and everybody's present and correct or coming shortly. Uh, so the second item on our agenda is a briefing by Dr Michael Potter uh, on the particular circumstances of the North and Michael is from the Assembly's Research and Information Service. So Michael is on line if you want to begin. That's great, thank you Chair. Can you hear me okay? We can. Great. So the, the paper in your pack looks at two aspects of the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. Uh, the particular circumstances as envisaged in the 1998 agreement and the particularity of Northern Ireland that has come into sharp focus following the UK decision to leave the EU. So I'll briefly summarise these in turn. So firstly, the particular circumstances and the 1998 agreement. There have been different, differing interpretations of what constitute particular circumstances in the context of the agreement. So firstly, the Bill of Rights Forum was divided uh, over the definition of particular circumstances. Uh, primarily, should they be only related to the conflict of any area of particularity or uh, how particular do they need to be? The Forum Chair, Chris Sedoti, suggested there's a difference between what is particular and what is unique to Northern Ireland. He reiterated what is set out in the agreement in relation to particular circumstances. So he set out five principles, those are equality, mutual respect, protection of civil, political, social and economic and cultural rights, a culture of tolerance and non-violence. He also set out eight specific rights that he said were contained in the agreement and they're listed in the paper in page four. Uh, Sidoti also listed some general references in the agreement that have a human rights basis, and these are also listed uh, in the paper. There are 12 of those. So uh, the, the, the second interpretation, I suppose, the second general approach uh, was by the Human Rights Commission in its advice uh, to the Secretary of State on a Bill of Rights, and they employed a specific formula for the consideration of what would be uh, particular circumstances. So firstly, has a right been abused, neglected or restricted here differently to elsewhere in the UK? Is that right related to an area that has been a location of conflict between the two main communities? Is there concern that right might be violated in the future? Is that right necessary or beneficial in enhancing mutual respect or parity of esteem? Does the right relate to one of the issues for consideration listed in the agreement? Does the right relate to one of those affirmed in the agreement? And finally, has it been otherwise referred to uh, in the agreement? So Appendix 1 of the paper that you have in your packs lists those proposals in the, in the advice. The UK government response rested on particular circumstances being demonstrably greater or more different in nature than elsewhere in the UK. So Appendix 2 in the paper gives uh, the, the UK government response to, to the, the Commission's advice. Uh, so it's all the responses to each of the points are, are given there and how they explain them. So the de debate has raised a number of fundamental questions. The first one of these is how particular do the circumstances need to be to be included? Are they just to be conflict related or can others be considered as well? For example, island status, rurality, social and economic uh, conditions. Thirdly, where is the comparator? Uh, so wh where, do they uh, wh 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 where do they have to be particular in comparison to? Is it within the United Kingdom? Is it uh, on the island of Ireland? Uh, or can there be differences between uh, uh, different locations in Northern Ireland? So, so where's that comparator? Um, how is the particularity to be measured? So what are the indicators as to, uh, as, as to what you want to, to, to have as particular? And then finally, 
are rights the most appropriate um, approach to, to address those uh, issues? So that summarises um, the, the, the general approaches to particular circumstances derived from, from the 1998 agreement, probably as envisaged at the time. Uh, circumstances that wouldn't have been necessarily known at the time are those um, relating to the UK decision to, to leave the EU. So this has placed into sharp focus areas in which Northern Ireland is indeed particular. The paper doesn't make any assertions in relation to additional circumstances to be taken into account in relation to any specific rights for a Bill of Rights, but just raises some considerations that the current circumstances uh, have raised. Likewise, it's not intended here to discuss in detail the impacts of withdrawal on Northern Ireland, other than to raise some general areas of particularity. So the first of these is the constitutional position of Northern Ireland. Uh, a majority of the UK voted to leave the EU in the referendum, but a majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain. The UK Supreme Court ruled uh, in 2017 that the withdrawal of Northern Ireland from the EU with the rest of the UK was not a breach of the 1998 agreement in relation to the right to determine the constitutional status uh, of Northern Ireland. So the second of these is identity. Uh, in an appeal in the uh, upper tribunal in 2019, it was stated there was a presumption of British citizenship in Northern Ireland, whereas Irish citizenship has to be asserted. The 1998 agreement recognises the birthright of all the people of Northern Ireland to identify themselves and be accepted as British or Irish. So the immigration rules were subsequently amended to provide for immigration status to be available to family, uh, family members of all the, mem uh, all the people of Northern Ireland. But the 1981 uh, British Nationality Act remains unchanged uh, as yet. Freedom of movement. Following withdrawal, uh, Northern Ireland will be the only part of the UK uh, with a land border with the EU. The Northern Ireland Protocol guarantees the maintenance of a common travel area. However, the final arrangements for the movement of goods between the UK and the EU have not been agreed yet, so it's unclear the extent to which uh, free movement can be maintained under these circumstances. And then finally, uh, EU human rights standards. The protocol states that there will be no diminution of rights in Northern Ireland following withdrawal. Appendix three of the paper in your packs uh, lists the EU equal treatment directives, the provisions of which will remain in effect uh, after withdrawal. This raises the question as to whether Northern Ireland will be kept in step with future developments in the EU. The Equality Commission and the Human Rights Commission have been appointed as a monitoring mechanism to ensure that there's no diminution of rights. The Human Rights Commission has stated to the Committee for the Executive Office that assurances have been given uh, by the UK government that standards will indeed keep in step with future developments in the, in the EU. But it's unclear how this might be maintained uh, over the uh, longer term. So that, that's just a brief summary of the paper. Uh, so if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Potter. That was useful, and um, the presentation that you gave us in written form was useful. I just want to ask some general questions. You've talked about, um, obviously, the impact of the particular circumstances, uh, the, the impact of Brexit on the particular circumstances, and the question whether or not that changes um, the constitutional position, and obviously the UK 2017 ruling. Um, would, would say that it doesn't, but then obviously there, there are people that feel that it does. I wonder how you would um, interpret the removal from the EU as having an impact on, on the particular circumstances of the North. No, that's set out in the NDNA as to what it is that we're discussing. Um, so you said it all. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I probably said it all in the presentation and, and it's in the paper there. There are those four main areas that, that, that I I'd identified. I probably wouldn't at this point uh, add uh, any any to that. <laughs> okay. So have you got ideas as to how we could address the gaps in a, in a Bill of Rights? Uh, well, uh, again, I think the, 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 the paper is, is quite... Um, specific in saying that it's not talking about specific rights, but really looking at, at, at how we, uh, we might look at particular circumstances rather than, um, I, I think there'd, there'd have to be inferences drawn from each of those um, circumstances themselves as to what rights they might indicate. 
um, but but really it would be up to up to the members which ones they, they decide to choose. Yeah, but the possibility is there through a bill of rights to address those gaps. Um, it, the, the, I, I suppose that there are different approaches to, to the way you might do it. Um, for example, if, if you look at areas uh, in the past where um, there have been challenges to rights standards in Northern Ireland, particularly if you take, for example, the European Court of Human Rights, um, those are the challenges to existing rights uh, and that they've not been implemented. So the addition of another right might not necessarily solve the problem. Um, it's more about implement implementation. So you'd have to look at each circumstance and then decide whether that requires an additional right, taking into account that a Bill of Rights will be the European Convention plus any additional rights. Um, it's it's how, how those additional rights might be formulated that don't exist at the moment. Okay, and so more how they're implemented then? To, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, you, you could look around the world at different um, uh, rights regimes in other countries uh, and see that, in fact, that there, there are awful lot of rights that, that people have elsewhere, um, but they're not necessarily adhered to. So, um, uh, so, so, so the, the, the circumstance of having a right um, it, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that, that, that you're going to get it. So it's just about as, as much about the implementation as it is about having it uh, on a Bill of Rights. That's okay. Thank you. I'll pass to Mike. Thank you. Chair. Chair, thank you. Michael, as, as ever, thank you very much for your work uh, on the paper. I, I think my comments and questions are, are probably uh, too political to be, to be firing your way. <laughs> with with one, one exception that you, you might be able to comment on, which is that whether it was deliberate uh, constructive ambiguity or whether it has become accidental ambiguity, is it fair to say that for 22 years the phrase particular circumstances has lacked any agreed definition. <laughs> uh, it would be, you're, you're absolutely right, um, you, it, it doesn't have an agreed uh, definition. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Um, Kelly, you were, I was going to call you Paula there, sorry. <laughs> Paula would love that. Um, thank you very much. I just wondered, in your paper, it refers back to um, what we know from 1998, but I would argue that the particularity of Northern Ireland actually has developed since that, that document from the, the Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast Agreement, um, where there are unique characteristics now in Northern Ireland because we have concentrated so long on binary traditions that the other traditions have been set aside and when we're looking at rights, um, like for instance, if we're considering political representation and participation in Northern Ireland, for instance, cross community doesn't include all types of community in Northern Ireland. I'm just wondering if there is any other research or papers that would outline the fact that the census is changing, yet we're going back to 22 years ago on using language and words. If there's anything else that we can look at that shows the diversity of Northern Ireland now. Uh, so certainly there's been a great deal of... of um of, of, of work done in, in looking at the profile of Northern Ireland now. Um, and in some of the more recent processes, consultations around a Bill of Rights, uh, particularly at the time that the advice was submitted to, uh, to, to, to the uh, Secretary of State um, and the, the subsequent consultation processes, there was a lot of work done by organisations in the community to bring in a, a broader range of people um, to, to talk about uh, what rights that they would envisage within Northern Ireland. For example, the migrant community or minority ethnic community. Um, and and, 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 and the, 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 there are other characteristics of Northern Ireland that maybe you wouldn't get quite so much uh, elsewhere that, that might be also valid that perhaps weren't discussed quite as much um, in 1998. For example, um, uh, rights relating to Irish travellers or, 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 or other communities. I'm just wondering as well, just on the growth of those who have grown up from them, you know, families have developed from them that are much more mixed, um, and the language that's used around that to recognise um, the new, more homogenous nationalist unionist identity that's there. Um, is there any research that, that can be brought forward um, that outlines that position? Because quite often measurement is used in binary terms as opposed to looking at the holistic view. I'm just wondering if there's anything there. 
Uh, yes, yes. Um, there's been a lot of work done uh, working with, with, with young people, but also a number of surveys over the years. And the Life and Time survey will, will show some things have changed significantly since 1998. Other things haven't uh, particularly. Um, so, uh, and things like segregation haven't changed a great different, uh, 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 greatly differently. Uh, but, but you're absolutely right that um, people have tried to look more broadly from from, from the the sort of the, the, the two traditions model. But I think it does um, it, it does highlight an issue that we're trying to deal with something that was agreed in 1998 um, today in a very changed Northern Ireland. Um, so trying to transfer the words, <clears throat> the words of an agreement at that time into the formulation of a Bill of Rights today um, will, will necessarily have some implications. Thank you. OK. Yeah, thank um, you. We'll transfer to the members that are on Starleaf. So D comes before O. So Mark, have you any questions? No, I'm, I'm all right. Chair for now, thank you, but thank you for the presentation. No bother. John? I'm OK, thank you for the presentation. Brilliant. That's us. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for joining us. Thank you very much, Chair. You can take your ease now. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you. OK, so, yeah, we, we are online. So the next um, item on our agenda, number three, is a briefing by Professor Tom Hatton, who is joining us via Starleaf as well. Hello, Professor. Can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Good. Brilliant. So um, the, the clerk's memo, uh, together with professor's, Professor Haddon's written submission, um, is between pages 38 and 60 of your packs. So, Professor Haddon, when you're ready, you can proceed with your briefing. Uh, yep, I seem to be a bit out of focus, but apart from that, um, it seems to be working. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to assist uh, your committee in, in any way that I can. And wh what I'm trying to do is to explain why what was a very sensible proposal in 1998 has caused so many problems and made, made, made so, so little progress. Uh, the underlying problem uh, for me has been a series of misunderstandings about what was intended. And uh, this, is, this is based upon my own involvement in, in the process, oh, for the best part, 20 years, uh, along with my, my good colleague, uh, Professor Kevin Boyle, who uh, unfortunately is no longer with us. So my objective this afternoon is to suggest uh, how we might get back to back on track uh, and what you may need to do if you really want to deliver what was intended. And uh, I've produced three simple points for you. In this presentation, they're coming in a slightly different order from the, the written presentation, but um, that doesn't matter. So point one, uh, you need to understand what was intended by the provisions for a Bill of Rights. It was not uh, intended to be a splendid new human rights bill that would set uh, an example to the whole world. It was uh, about a Bill of Constitutional Rights uh, for all the, the different peoples and communities in Northern Ireland, along with the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and I, I try to explain that in relation to uh, what happened at a couple of meetings in Kells in 1993 and 1994. Um, Kevin Boyle and I uh, approached the Standing Advisory Commission on Human Rights saying that we, we really needed to uh, get together with the parties to discuss what kind of a Bill of Rights would be appropriate. 
and that, that was agreed. And there were two meetings, one in 1993 and one in 1994. They were technically confidential. Uh, they were organized by the Standing Advisory Commission on Human Rights. And uh, they went on for some time. I have a, uh, a complete copy of the, it, it's rather a big fat file, but if, if any of you are interested, I have a, a complete file of who was there, uh, what uh, papers were presented, and also my own notes of uh, who said what at the meeting. And uh, from my point of view, and, and also Kevin Boyle's, a key document was a paper on what uh, <clears throat> kind of add-ons there should be. Uh, the idea was that uh, both uh, the UK and Ireland would incorporate the European Convention on Human Rights. That was Kevin Boyle's uh, primary concern. And my concern was that there should be add-ons uh, to uh, fill gaps um, in the European Convention, which didn't really address the particular problems of Northern Ireland. And uh, I've uh, appended that paper to the written version. Uh, but just to summarize, uh, the add-ons that we suggested then were, first of all, uh, what kind of self-determination there should be, uh, what kind of recognition of the two communities there should be, uh, what kind of provisions there should be on education rights and language rights, uh, but uh, then uh, on identity, uh, the right to be British, Irish, or both. And then uh, all of those uh, appeared in the Good Friday Agreement. The only one that didn't was protection from emergency powers. Uh, the follow-up to that uh, that Kevin Boyle and I engaged in uh, was, uh, first of all, a book called Northern Ireland, The Choice, in which we developed on what we had said, the incorporation of the ECHR plus some add-ons. Uh, similarly, in our, uh, in our uh, uh, contributions to the OPSOIL Forum, uh, and to the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation in Dublin. Uh, we, we kept saying the same things. And uh, Kevin, Kevin Boyle, who was uh, well connected with the Irish government uh, at all times, uh, he, was, he, he told me that he was told by his contacts in the Irish government that because uh, there hadn't been a huge amount of discussion on what should be contained in a Bill of Rights. Everybody was in, was in favor of a Bill of Rights, but very little discussion on what it is, should actually contain. Kevin was told that uh, in the absence of discussion, the, uh, the two governments uh, and um, uh, Senator Mitchell went back to what we had written and adopted uh, more or less in, in the same words what we had been arguing for. So, uh, in my view, that is a, a good way to, uh, to understand where that formulation came from, the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. It was to do with uh, things that were not covered by the European Convention on Human Rights, but would be particularly helpful and necessary in Northern Ireland, given its particular uh, population and its particular background and history. So that's, that's, the, that's the first point. The, the second point is uh, what international experience uh, was to be relevant. And again, uh, I say, this was not international experience on a more extensive uh, Bill of Rights uh, than uh, was, was covered in the, EH, in the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, it, it wasn't about what I used to call the all singing, all dancing model of human rights that would be you know, better than anybody else's human rights in the world. It was about rights in, needed in a divided society. Um, uh, there was a lot of discussion in our papers at that time 
to other divided societies, places like uh, Canada, like Belgium, like Bosnia, and all of those uh, places have got uh, uh, constitutional bills of rights which address the particular circumstances of their populations. And almost all of them include provisions in respect of language, they include provisions in respect of education, they include provisions in respect of the cultures of the peoples and uh, the identity of the people. And um, the difficulty has been that successive uh, commissioners in the, the Northern Ireland uh, Human Rights Commission have ignored that aspect of the issue. Uh, that is a, a bill of constitutional rights for all the peoples of a territory rather than just uh, a bill of human rights for each individual. Uh, and both the commissions, the first one that I was involved in under the leadership of, of uh, um, Bryce Dixon, and also the second one under the, the leadership uh, of, um, uh, her name has, has gone, but it will come. Um, Yes, Monica Williams, sorry about that. Uh, I'm getting old. Um, the, the final draft of Monica McWilliams' version omitted everything that we had included in the, the first draft about the Irish language, for example, and about integrated schools. Uh, so the trend as things developed within the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and also with the political parties, was away from the idea of a constitutional bill of rights for a divided society towards uh, including as much as they could possibly justify of developing human rights uh, from across the world. And I think that that was a mistake. Um, the two governments, on the other hand, uh, had a much clearer idea of what the the Bill of Rights was supposed to be, and I, I, I've written it down, but I will uh, read into the, the record the terms of the British-Irish Agreement, which was attached to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, and that provides for a, quite a limited set of rights to be guaranteed whichever state has sovereignty over the territory uh, to be exercised, and this is a direct quotation, on behalf of all the people in the diversity of their identities and traditions uh, and shall be founded on the principles of full respect for and equality of civil, political, social and cultural rights of freedom from discrimination for all citizens and of parity of esteem and of just and equal treatment for the identity, ethos and aspiration of both communities. Uh, going back to the, the point that was, was was raised uh, to, to Michael Potter. Note that that covers uh, all the people of Northern Ireland in the diversity of their identities and traditions. That's not just the, the, the two major communities, it's everybody else, the people that, that I usually call the people in between. So uh, for me, uh, that's a very helpful summary of what the two governments uh, intended the, the proposed Bill of Rights to be about the incorporation of the European Convention of Human Rights and then these uh, constitutional protections for all the communities and peoples. That's point two. Point three, uh, how, how, do we, how do we deliver the uh, proposed uh, Bill of Rights? Uh, Chris Dodotti, who was the chair of the political party uh, discussion in uh, 2007, I think it was, uh, commented afterwards that drafting a Bill of Rights is easy. Uh, the difficult bit is getting it adopted. And uh, I used to think of myself uh, while I was on the Northern Ireland uh, Human Rights Commission as, as Mr. Deliverability. I was focusing on what can be delivered and uh, that, I think, has also been um, lacking 
in the way that the drafts have been developed. Uh, for SAR, it was, it was clear that the Northern Ireland office was concerned about readacross, was concerned that provisions should not be adopted in Northern Ireland, uh, which uh, would be equally relevant in uh, deprived uh, parts of the rest of the UK. And uh, the Northern Ireland office submitted a paper to the, the Kells meetings, uh, making precisely that point that uh, we, <clears throat> it was not going to be helpful to propose uh, provisions uh, that could be read across to other parts of the United Kingdom, because that wasn't what was intended. Uh, and similarly, um, in relation to the, uh, the draft provisions that uh, Bryce Dixon's commission proposed, uh, we got a, a very uh, blunt response from the Labour government, from Des Brown, saying precisely that, that far too much of what you are proposing is not relevant uh, to the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. It would be relevant to all other deprived parts of the United Kingdom, and that was not what was intended. Uh, the Irish government has been less uh, concerned about this, uh, but um, they also have an obligation uh, under the terms of the, the, the Good Friday Belfast Agreement to adopt uh, the same provisions in the Republic as, as would apply in Northern Ireland. And they have uh, got the, the same concerns about read across. And uh, the, the issue is whether and to what extent people in Northern Ireland are entitled to better and more extensive human rights than the rest of the people in Great Britain and the rest of the people in the, in the Republic of Ireland. And uh, you might just think about the response of uh, the politicians and the, the peoples in Great Britain and in the, uh, in the Republic to the idea that the people of Northern Ireland who have caused so much problem over the years should have so much better rights than everybody else. And uh, my view uh, is that they wouldn't think that was uh, viable politics or a very good idea. So uh, what needs to be done? And uh, I've got just a, a few thoughts for you. Um, first of all, uh, remember that the bill is to be enacted by the Westminster Parliament and then paralleled in the Republic. And uh, what matters is the view of the two governments as to what the interpretation of the wording in, in the agreement is, not uh, my particular uh, interpretation, your particular interpretation. It, it is the interpretation of the two governments as to what they intended uh, rather than uh, look, looking at dictionaries or looking at what other people have said about the proper interpretation. It's the two governments who are uh, in charge of this process and you should uh, engage with them as to what they are prepared to accept uh, rather than uh, developing your own ideas as to what would, what would be a, a nice bill to have. And to do that, I think it would be uh, a good idea to uh, engage with what the two governments uh, said in their uh, British-Irish agreement appended to the Good Friday Agreement, which, which I've read out. Uh, and I think it would be a good idea for you to attempt to work towards a text that reflects that uh, agreement between the two governments, what they have committed themselves to. Uh, and that would be something that would be transferable in the event of either a more formal provision for joint authority between the British and Irish governments. At the moment, we've, we've got a kind of ad hoc joint authority uh, every time things break down 
in the north, uh, the two governments uh, rally around and knock heads together and uh, uh, reinstate the, the, the terms of, of the Good Friday Agreement. And or, uh, in the event of, of unification, the British-Irish Agreement uh, refers specifically to whichever government has sovereignty. So they, they too were thinking about the possibility of transfer uh, of um, authority from the UK to the, uh, the Irish Republic. So uh, that's all I have to say. Um, look carefully at the terms of the British-Irish agreement. Don't spend too much time arguing about the meaning of the particular circumstances and engage with the two governments as to what an appropriate uh, development of those ideas might be um, and then we might get somewhere. That's enough for the time being. Thank you very much, Professor. And that was interesting and useful, just like your written submission was. And I know you focused quite retrospectively on what the intention was at the time. Um, but I just wanted to ask you a question, I suppose, that brings it into present day. And obviously, our circumstances at the minute are quite different to, to what they were 22 and even 12 or 13 years ago. I want to ask you, given the fact that you've said that um, a Bill of Rights at that time was to be ECHR plus, what impact do you think leaving the European Union has on and uh, if, if there are going to be gaps as a result of that? Uh, not at all. Um, the, the European Convention on Human Rights is nothing to do with the European Union. It's a Council of Europe provision and uh, as, as long as the, the two governments are bound by the European Convention on Human Rights, then uh, that, that's what matters. So you would... the, the, the European Union has got little to do with it. They have their own uh, fundamental rights convention, but that's, uh, that's different. Yeah, so obviously we're, we're losing the charter rights but not the convention rights, but you don't think that there are any gaps to be created by leaving the EU? Uh, not, not in particular. I think the gaps are the gaps that uh, Kevin Boyle and many others and I identified way back in uh, the mid-1990s. There are gaps in the European Convention of Human Rights uh, that need to be addressed in respect of a place like Northern Ireland, which is divided between two main communities and a lot of uh, people in between those two communities, as you were discussing earlier. So following on from that, obviously, we have, and, and I touched on this with um, Dr. Potter as well, around the sort of the party esteem focus and the fact that the two big communities needed to be treated with respect and, and as the same. And we see the, the case of the, the Emma Souza case is referenced in his presentation and it has demonstrated that from the British government's perspective, everyone here is, is viewed as British. And then the, the sort of citizenship rights that we see called into question now going forward and the, the freedom of movement and the fact that there's been quoted that there's going to be an inevitable asymmetry and that passport holders here, depending on what their passport is, could have different rights. Do you think there are gaps there that could be plugged? Um, not for the people of Northern Ireland, because uh, uh, we have got special rights to be both British and Irish, and both, so that um, that issue, I think, is resolved insofar as the people are concerned. Uh, there are clearly economic implications of uh, what's happening at the moment in relation to uh, where the border shall be between uh, uh, the UK and uh, the Irish Republic and where we in Northern Ireland fit. But that's, uh, that's not specifically uh, an issue for the Bill of Rights. Yeah, so th there's economic implications that are perhaps going to apply. You could, you could argue that the, there will be a disproportionate effect in the North compared to, you know, the UK or or Britain. But just in terms of the fact that, like Emma D'Souza had to renounce British 
citizenship that she had never engaged in. Uh, are, are you referring to the case that has uh, recently been, been discussed yeah. on, on, on this? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I've got no problem about that. Um, it, it seems to me that the uh, the compromise that has been reached is let's not uh, spend too much time arguing about this. Uh, everything uh, is okay as it stands is, is probably the best sort of solution. Okay. Thank you. We'll go to Mick, the Vice Chair. Hi, Professor. Um, I, I acknowledge you, you were focusing on delivering what was intended and you define what was intended as a set of constitutional rights to be added on to the European Convention. But we must not forget that the eight little syllables that make up particular circumstances have fueled a 22-year debate that is still live. Um, you seem to be suggesting we shouldn't allow ourselves to be constrained by particular circumstances. Uh, and I'm wondering how that impacts on how things might be viewed to have changed since 1998. For example, uh, a greater focus amongst many people, particularly young people today, on environmental rights, which may not have been discussed at all 22 years ago. Uh, the impact of the pandemic on health rights, particularly of people suffering, for example, from, from cancer, whose treatments may have been postponed because of COVID. Um, what, what, what do you think? I go back to what I said earlier, that all those issues are clearly important, but they affect equally the people of the rest of the UK, uh, Great Britain, Scotland, Wales, England. Uh, they affect the people of the Republic. And there is no particular reason, in my view, that a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland should jump ahead of what is being uh, promised or delivered for the rest of the people of these islands. And the, my other point is with regard to the D'Souza case, which, which seemed to bring into sharp focus a tension between identity and citizenship. And as you say, the, the agreement is clear on identity. You self-define as British or Irish or both. Uh, but does that have an implication for citizenship? And if we do something in a Bill of Rights in that territory, does it have a read across or repercussive, repercussive potential? Well, again, I go back to the terms of the British-Irish agreement uh, appended to the Good Friday Agreement, which, as I've said, uh, covers all the peoples of Northern Ireland in their different identities and, and cultures. So uh, I'm not, not concerned about that. What I am concerned is that uh, you should focus on the development of those uh, uh, words in the British-Irish agreement, uh, rather than spending a huge amount of time arguing about what the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland are. It's, it's, for me, it's quite clear what they are. Uh, it is that uh, we have two main communities, we have a lot of people in between, and uh, that there is the, the potential for a change in the constitutional status of this particular piece of territory. Uh, it might become subject to joint authority, or it might become part of the United Ireland. And I just, sorry, just a, a fi final point on a constitutional question you might, you might have an opinion on. Uh, Lord Empey, on my behalf, contacted the Home Office about uh, Emma D'Souza. And the then Minister of State, Caroline Noakes, responded to say that the British Nationality Act of 1981 effectively trumped the international 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Well, my view on that is that uh, the, the resolution that appears to have been reached is, is much more satisfactory. In other words, don't spend a huge amount of time arguing uh, about this particular issue, uh, but focus on developing rights for all the people of, uh, of Northern Ireland, uh, rather than uh, going back to, to UK legislation. 
uh, I gather that the, the case has effectively been sidelined and uh, uh, a satisfactory resolution has been uh, reached. Professor, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Michelle? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, you quoted um, Chris Sidotti when he said that drafting is easy, but, getting, but the difficulty was getting it adopted. And yet, really from your introduction, you were saying that there were always misunderstandings of what was intended. So I suppose this has been quite a challenging process right throughout, even just from um, really understanding what was, what was intended. Um, how, how do you go about actually then building consensus um, on the value or purpose of a Bill of Rights when those who, who are supposed to know what it was intended to do can't get it right? Uh, very good question. Um, as I've tried to explain, uh, my view is that what was intended was uh, quite short and sweet and is uh, more or less summarized in the provisions of the, uh, the British-Irish agreement in, in the way that I, I've uh, read out and, and explained. And that the arguments uh, on, among human rights lawyers as what would be an ideal Bill of Rights uh, for Northern Ireland to set an example to the rest of the world is misguided because, as I've said, uh, the people of the rest of the United Kingdom and the people of the South are unlikely to see that the people of Northern Ireland deserve better rights uh, than they do. Yeah, but there, there is a challenge, obviously, in Northern Ireland in perhaps the way that rights have been, um, I suppose, articulated. Uh, in some ways, they've been politicised in a way that makes it very difficult for another side then to appreciate their value to themselves. Uh, that, that's true. I mean, <laughs> you politicians uh, will know that there are disagreements on, on all these issues. Uh, my advice to you is to go back to what the two governments uh, wrote in their agreement and have continued to stress, uh, particularly in the latest document that, that set up uh, your, your committee. They have said go back to the terms of the uh, agreement and I'm suggesting that the best way of doing that is to look at precisely what the two governments have committed themselves to in their uh, treaty. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a, a number of um, presentations, um, international presentations, um, and there's been a discussion in relation to the practicalities and the outworkings of, of a Bill of Rights. Have you given any consideration um, to the role of the judicial system? Um, and um, and the type of remedies that would be appropriate for a Northern Ireland context? I don't think they would be very different from the provisions that are already in law in both the Republic and in the, uh, and in, in, uh, the United Kingdom on the implementation of the European Convention of Human Rights. It seems to me that they have worked reasonably well and um, why try to reinvent an entirely new structure for them? Okay, thank you. The point, the point is that uh, a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland becomes part of the, the law of Northern Ireland in the same way that the European Convention is now part of the law of uh, the UK and the Irish Republic. Okay, thank you. Kelly, do you have a no, 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 that's okay. We'll go to the members that are with us via Starley. So, Mark, do you have any questions? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I have a frog in my throat there. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, Pro Professor Haddon and some interesting points raised by uh, colleagues there as well. Now, I, I know you're keen, I suppose, that going forward, we don't waste more time. I don't even mean us as a committee, maybe us as an assembly or as a society, uh, making the arguments over the nationality and citizenship issue. And I think you said that that's resolved as far as people 
are concerned, the problem is though it's not resolved or it's not always resolved as far as policy is concerned. But uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you, this is a field that you've worked on for a very uh, long time, but when you were sitting down all those years ago and writing or envisaging what might be in a Bill of Rights or, or how it could or should look, in your opinion, here, do you any inkling that here we would be in the year 2020 and still not have a Bill of Rights? I, 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 I know you weren't, I'm sure, naive enough to think that this wouldn't be uh, problematic because sadly so much here is and has been problematic. But I, I don't know, would you be in a position either they, they sort of speculate as to how you think the absence of such a, a piece of work or, or us having a Bill of Rights has been to our detriment uh, in the intervening period? Um, my view on that, uh, as things have developed, is that we're getting on uh, reasonably well without a Bill of Rights. It's not uh, the, the, the point of, of putting a Bill of Rights into the Good Friday Agreement was to uh, give confidence to uh, all the people or all the communities, uh, the two main communities and the people in between, all the, all the people in Northern Ireland, give, give them confidence that they, uh, that their, their respective communal and individual rights would be protected. In a sense, uh, that is being delivered by the document that I keep referring to, which is the agreement between the two governments. Uh, and the fact that we haven't managed to get agreement between the parties uh, or the, the lawyers uh, on, the, on the, the various human rights commissions, uh, to me is understandable, but not, not that important. We're getting on reasonably well uh, as we are. It would be nice to have uh, a Bill of Rights that did the job that was intended uh, particularly in the context that there may be a change of constitutional status at some time in the future. So it would be helpful to have that written down uh, in more detail than is provided in the British-Irish agreement, which I keep referring to. So I, I think there is a job to be done to fill out uh, what is referred to in that British-Irish agreement which, uh, as I've, I've said before, doesn't just deal with the two communities. It deals with all the people in their different identities. That would be helpful, but uh, we're getting on reasonably well without it. Thank you, Mark. No, no, that's fine. Thank you, Tom. John, do you have any questions? Oh, I'm okay. Thank you for the presentation. That was very interesting. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Professor. Well, thank you. And if there's anything I can help with further, I might even draft you a bill if you ask me. <laughs> if we ask nice enough. Thanks very much for your time this afternoon. Okay, thank you very much too. Brilliant. Okay, members, if we can go on then to um, item number four, Chairperson's Business. So we have um, two, two room plans just in light of the ongoing restrictions. Um, we have been provided with room plans for room 29 and 30. Uh, layouts include a maximum number of people allowed in each of the rooms. In this room that we normally meet in, the maximum number of people of, is 11 and we don't hit that. So if members are content, we'll just note those plans. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, last... Sorry, just for a point of information, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, Chair, yeah? We can. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I've raised concerns with these room plans and other committees. Uh, they're based on, it's a risk assessment based on measurement only. There's no account taken of uh, ventilation in the rooms or time that someone spends in the rooms. And in fairness to those who carried them out, there's no specific guidance in, in those regards. Now, it's up to each committee how many people they approve to be in each room at each time. Uh, and I, I usually uh, star leaf in, so it doesn't directly affect me, but it's just worth noting. Oh, that's 100%. Somebody else trying to get in. We're currently at six, but we... 
Hey, are you can store. We thought we were getting a break in there. Sorry, I'm late. I had a thing and carried off. I had to go to. No, you're okay. Um, so we were just um, noting the the room plans. So we'll include that addition from John. Um, but we're we're not at the eleven, so I think we're okay. So then we've got the draft minutes from both last week's meeting and the week before, um, because we hadn't had quorum last week, we weren't able to agree the previous week's uh, minutes. If everyone's content, yep, yep, happy days. So we then go to uh, correspondence, agenda item number seven. So that's page seventy-four of your um, pack. Is everyone happy to note the correspondence? Okay. I know that we have a, a letter there from um, Dr. Amanda Cal Ripley. We had asked her about the questionnaire that she had used in her research and she's provided it. So it might be something that we can use when we go into informal session um, around these questions. Then number eight, the forward work plan. Mark, I think maybe you're not muted. Oh, I was muted. All right, sorry, it must have been John, although it's saying we lane through him. Not sure what's going on. Okay, okay. Um, and then any other business? None. None. Perfect. So, the date, time, and place of next meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're go oh no, we need to do the informal session first. So we'll put us out of public session. We'll do this bit first. Twenty-nine. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room Twenty-nine. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room Twenty-nine.